The new documentary, This Changes Everything, directed by Tom Donahue, uh, looks at the uh, plight of women throughout the history of Hollywood, but something that takes on a special resonance uh, in the last few years. I'm Tony Ruiz of Gold Derby, uh, with Tom Donahue, the director. And, and Tom, I, the title, This Changes Everything, in many ways is certainly kind of an ironic title because of the way that it's addressed in the film. But I wonder, as you worked on the documentary and with the things in the news about the Me Too movement and Harvey Weinstein and workplace harassment in general, has anything actually changed? Yes. I mean, even uh, my executive producer, Gina Davis, thinks that, and Gina's very cynical about these things, thinks that we may be at some sort of a tipping point. Now, are things going to change for women behind the scenes in terms of workplace discrimination, in terms of opportunities as directors? We are seeing an uptick, mostly in television. Uh, however, we do occasionally see these upticks when there's a lot of attention, when there's a spotlight put on the issue. But then a lot of times when that spotlight goes away, the uptick goes down and we go back to where we were. So uh, I'm a bit cynical about that, and I, I'm not sure uh, if we are at a tipping point or not. I'm certainly hoping we are. So you brought up the fact that we're seeing that change mostly in television. One of, I think, the most fascinating parts of this film is you know, the, the way that you, know, you were able to get you know, an actual network head, John Langraff of FX, who actually did look at these, this information about the lack of a female presence, particularly behind the camera, and started instituting change. But yet he's really kind of the only studio head or a person in a real position of power to, to really go, yeah, you know what? Hey, I screwed up. Uh, first of all, how were you able to get him on camera? Why do you think there aren't more people, both in television and film, that aren't making the same change based on the success he's had? Well, those are two different questions. So he, uh, it, it's hard to get men in general, I found, to go on camera, to go on the record about this issue. Even the men I did interview, many of them would kind of bargain with me, like, dude, you're going to uh, destroy my career over this. You're going to take some lines out of context, and that's going to be the end of my career. And I would have to tell them I'm not going to do that. I'll protect you. I really appreciate you going on camera and talking about this issue. I really, really respect John Langraff. And it took about a year to get him on camera. Initially, uh, the communications department of effects didn't want to do it. Then they decided, yes, we want to tell the story, which I thought was incredibly great because John Langraff is a, a real role model in the film. I think the film without John Langraff would be, uh, would not be as effective because I wanted to have a, a male in power who was a role model that other men could look up to and could almost see as someone who could give them cover. John Langraff did it and look, they got nominated for 50 Emmys. So we should do it too. So why don't you think more, you have this success story at FX, and even if television is making more headways than certainly the film industry is, why is there still the hang up? Particularly one of the things you talk about in the film is how, you know, in the, in the days of the silent era, where there were a lot of women at the forefront, there were a lot of women directing their own films and and making money off of their films, and then all of a sudden this change, you know, they kind of disappear from the scene. Um, why do you think that's still, that's still so pernicious, in, yeah. particularly in film? Good question. I think uh, when 90% of the resources are held by one gender, so when men have 90 or say 85% of the writing jobs, 92% of the directing jobs in feature films, it's really hard to get those powerful men to want to give up their power. And that's really the issue. It's very hard on an individual personal basis for a studio exec to not give the work to the male director who feels they have been entitled to that work. That's a system, that's a boys club that's been in place for many decades. And it's very hard to break that. It, there's a lot of inertia involved. It's really hard to make change. You know, white men, when the, uh, the playing field tips even 4%, they feel like it's a radical revolution and that the world is falling apart. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's such a shame if they lose even a bit of their power. Um, but so I, I want to start with, I want to look at, first of all, this. you said this film is executive produced by Gina Davis, who's also 
getting the Gene Herschel Award this year uh, at the Governor's Awards. Um, how did how did your two paths cross initially, and how did that bring you to this project? Well, that didn't actually bring me to the project. I brought her to it. So I started this scene <laughs> when a uh, a female publicist asked if I would consider doing a documentary on this issue. And uh, my producing partner, also a male, and I looked at each other and without hesitation, we said yes. And, you know, this was not, there was no financing. We spent the next year uh, working on paid on this as we started kind of interviewing, uh, doing some initial interviews, piggybacking on another film we were finishing. Uh, then about a year in, I realized if I'm going to make a movie about workplace discrimination in Hollywood, how am I going to get an audience outside of Hollywood to care about this issue? And I knew to do that, I had to connect the dots, that the fact that there were so few women telling stories that went around the world meant that your children and the children around the world, basically systemic sexism was being perpetuated by these male dominated stories that Hollywood was producing. So I knew I had to deal with on-screen representation. And I realized that's the work, that's when I learned about the work of Gina Davis and her institute. So in 2016, I sat for lunch with Gina and I pitched her. I said, I don't want any money. I would love to use your data and I would love to tell your story as part of the fabric of the film. And she said, as long as the whole film is not about me and I'm a part of the story, I'm really happy to be a part of it. And she's been really supportive since. So I, one of the things that's always so fascinating to me, particularly about documentary filmmaking, is that, you know, in this era of multimedia and, um, you know, behind the scenes featurettes about about studio films. Documentary is still in many ways, I think, to the mass audience is kind of like there's a certain air of mystery about it, about the process and the amount of time that you, that documentary filmmakers spend on these uh, films. So can you kind of just walk us through the process of of where do you even start and 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 how does the process change and evolve? as you are digging into the subject matter. Right, so I started uh, at the end of 2014, the Sony hack happened and uh, the issue of equal pay kind of blew up because of Jennifer Lawrence being paid less than Bradley Cooper on American Hustle. That was a big deal. And then Patricia Arquette got up at the Oscars in uh, March of 2015 and you know said, we deserve equal pay and Meryl Streep stood up and cheered. And that was really, what was happening in Hollywood when we started this. So the idea that this was going to be about equal pay, this was going to be about ageism, all of these issues that I thought the film was going to be about in the beginning, the film ended up not being about. And I always say, if you go into a documentary knowing what the film is going to be, then you're going to make a bad documentary. That you have to go in and be entirely, entirely open. And you have to simply listen to the people that you're interviewing, that you're learning about, that you're talking to, who will guide you, their wisdom. They've been at this a long time. They know this issue. They've lived this issue. They're the ones who know the story. And it's my job to just give them a platform with my skill as a documentary filmmaker. Uh, so you have to completely be ready for that to change. And then at the end of 2016, Donald Trump got elected. And that really threw me into what I would say is the third act of the film. When you go from women being siloed, being separated in the first two acts, to suddenly coming together in solidarity in the third act, in the Women's March, the creation of Time's Up, et cetera. And to me, one of the most fascinating parts of, of the film is that that second act about the, the directors in the 1970s, these female directors, some of whom have won Emmys and even an Oscar, um, really coming together and attacking this issue, um, you know, getting together with the ACLU and really it, it's a it's a gut punch in the middle when they're basically told by a female judge, um, you know, you're not doing this the right way or it's basically just putting a stop to it. Um, they in many ways become kind of the heroes of this, uh, the unsung heroes of this film. Um, do you think that there's a there's a trajectory where do you think that there will be a point where this doesn't become an issue where we don't have to talk about it anymore or do you think that it's going to be a long long slog until we finally get there uh, my instinct is that it's going to be a long slog that it's very hard to break the patriarchy uh, and I also I would never want to say it could happen quickly 
I never want to sound positive that change is actually happening because the worst thing that can do is breed complacency. And that's what I've seen time and time again and why the film is called This Changes Everything. Because a movie like Thelma and Louise comes out and everyone thinks, oh my God, now we're going to have so many action movies starring women. And then that doesn't happen. And it doesn't happen because we all just think it's going to happen. So nobody does the work to actually make it happen. So I want to go on record to say I think it's going to take a long time and I think all of us have to be conscious of this issue and really, really keep on fighting. So I, I think that one of the one of the places that that kind of strikes me is that um, you're making this film and then really kind of in the midst of making this film is when a lot of the stuff about the Me Too movement and Harvey Weinstein comes out. When you get stuff like that that's happening in the middle of making a film, um, just what goes through your head? Does are you excited when stuff? I know it sounds like a weird term to say you're excited by that, but um, does it does it change your approach in terms of what you're doing? It didn't so much change my approach. By then, I already had about 120 interviews. I knew what my film needed to be because there was a lot leading up to the Me Too movement that I was already listening to in interviews. The fact that it exploded was almost secondary to the fact that I understood why it had exploded. And I needed to make sure the audience understand why it exploded. And then I needed to make sure that became part of the film. So I always saw it as the third act of the movie. I was not making the Me Too movie. I could have shifted gears. I had enough material that I could have made that movie. But that, that was being talked about in the media constantly. And I realized for my film to really cut through, I needed to keep it focused on workplace discrimination. Because in Hollywood, that is talked about a lot less. And one of the things that, that I think has has developed since then, you know, you had Francis McDormand at the Oscars, you know, calling for inclusion writers and, and Michelle Williams great speech at the Emmys about, you know, women getting what they need to do their jobs. Um, and I guess one of the things that is really kind of fascinating to me about not just this film, but your previous films is that there's, um, there's a certain kind of, I don't know if this is the right word, revolutionary quality to some of the things that you're talking about, about th these, these changes, these, these, uh, institutional changes, whether it's, uh, you know, thank you for your service or, or casting by, which in its own way really talked about the gender issue. So what drives you to a particular subject? I have a deep sense of injustice, and that started really, I didn't know until I was a kid, and I was actually reading superhero comic books, and I believed in, you know, truth, justice in the American way. I was very idealistic. When I was 10, I saw the movie Gandhi, and then I saw the movie Gandhi about five times in the theater. It's like I wanted to be Gandhi. I just had this incredible sense that the British should leave India because they don't deserve to be there. So with that in mind, when I became a filmmaker, you know, initially I wanted to be Scorsese, Spielberg. But then I found out when I was in film school, that's not what I wanted to do. I actually wanted to fight injustice. So for me, any topic that relates to that in any way I can help lessen the amount of injustice, that's what I want to do with my filmmaking. And that's what I've done over several films at this point. So with that in mind, uh, are there... Are there other topics that you're just going, oh, I got to tackle this one. Oh, I got to get on this one. Yeah. So right now I'm finishing, I'm wrapping a documentary on gun violence in America that that is set uh, amid the legislative battle over the red flag bill in Colorado. And I've been filming there for the last year. We are also, my company's producing a documentary on the youth movement around climate, the climate crisis. So those are what we're doing right now. And I'm doing a documentary on Dean Martin just for fun. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I did not see that one coming. I was like, <laughs> gun violence, climate change. Well, I still do these quirky little documentaries also. It's just you have to. You, you can't take on huge systemic institutions every time you make a film. It will tire you out. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tom, congratulations on the film. It, it really is, I think, a really important uh topic that could not be more timely and um just so well done uh, thank you so much tom uh, oh, the film you. is uh, this changes everything uh where can people find it tom uh right now it's on amazon it's on itunes it will be uh on stars december 16th on cable all right and Great. it's on voodoo and voodoo and all those uh, different platforms
<laughs> uh, well, congratulations. Really great job, Tom. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Take care.